Moby Dick by Herman Melville Chapters 42 to 44 Chapter 42 The Whiteness of the Whale What the white whale was to Ahab has been hinted. What at times he was to me, as yet remains unsaid. Aside from those more obvious considerations touching Moby Dick, which could not but occasionally awaken in any man's soul some alarm, there was another thought, or rather vague, nameless horror concerning him, which at times by its intensity completely overpowered all the rest, and yet so mystical and well-nigh ineffable was it, that I almost despair of putting it in a comprehensible form, it was the whiteness of the whale that above all things appalled me. But how can I hope to explain myself here, and yet in some dim random way explain myself I must, else all these chapters might be naught. Though in many natural objects whiteness refiningly enhances beauty, as if imparting some special virtue of its own, as in marbles, japonicas, and pearls, and though various nations have in some ways recognized a certain royal preeminence in this hue, even the barbaric grand old kings of Pegu placing the title Lord of the White Elephants, above all their other magniloquent ascriptions of dominion, and the modern kings of Siam unfurling the same snow-white quadruped in the royal standard, and the Hanoverian flag bearing the one figure of a snow-white charger, and the great Austrian empire, Caesarian, heir to overlording Rome, having for the imperial color the same imperial hue, and though this preeminence in it applies to the human race itself, giving the white man ideal mastership over every dusky tribe, and though, besides all this, whiteness has been even made significant of gladness, for among the Romans a white stone marked a joyful day, and though in other mortal sympathies and symbolizings this same hue is made the emblem of many touching noble things, the innocence of brides, the benignity of age, though among the red men of America the giving of the white belt of wampum was the deepest pledge of honor, though in many climes whiteness typifies the majesty of justice in the ermine of the judge, and contributes to the daily state of kings and queens drawn by milk-white steeds, though even in the higher mysteries of the most august religions it has been made the symbol of the divine spotlessness and power, by the Persian fire-worshippers, the white-forked flame being held the holiest on the altar, and in the Greek mythologies great Jove himself being made incarnate in a snow-white bull, and though to the noble Iroquois the midwinter sacrifice of the sacred white dog was by far the holiest festival of their theology, that spotless, faithful creature being held the purest envoy they could send to the great spirit with the annual tidings of their own fidelity, and though directly from the Latin word for white all Christian priests derive the name of one part of their sacred vesture, the alb, or tunic, worn beneath the cassock, and though among the holy pomps of the Romish faith white is specially employed in the celebration of the Passion of our Lord, though in the vision of St. John white robes are given to the redeemed, and the four-and-twenty elders stand clothed in white before the great white throne, and the holy one that sitteth there white like wool. Yet for all these accumulated associations with whatever is sweet and honorable and sublime, there yet lurks an elusive something in the innermost idea of this hue which strikes more of panic to the soul than that redness which affrights in blood. This elusive quality it is which causes the thought of whiteness, when divorced from more kindly associations, and coupled with any object terrible in itself, to heighten that terror to the furthest bounds. Witness the white bear of the poles, and the white shark of the tropics. What but their smooth, flaky whiteness makes them the transcendent horrors they are? That ghastly whiteness it is, 
which imparts such an abhorrent mildness, even more loathsome than terrific, to the dumb gloating of their aspect, so that not the fierce-fanged tiger in his heraldic coat can so stagger courage as the white-shrouded bear or shark. Footnote. With reference to the polar bear, it may possibly be urged by him who would fain go still deeper into this matter, that it is not the whiteness separately regarded which heightens the intolerable hideousness of that brute. For analyzed, that heightened hideousness, it might be said, only rises from the circumstance that the irresponsible ferociousness of the creature stands invested in the fleece of celestial innocence and love, and hence by bringing together two such opposite emotions in our minds, the polar bear frightens us with so unnatural a contrast. But even assuming all this to be true, yet were it not for the whiteness, you would not have that intensified terror. As for the white shark, the white gliding ghostliness of repose in that creature, when beheld in his ordinary moods, strangely tallies with the same quality in the polar quadruped. This peculiarity is most vividly hit by the French, in the name they bestow upon that fish. The Romish mass for the dead begins with requiem eternum, eternal rest, whence requiem denominating the mass itself and any other funeral music. Now, in allusion to the white, silent stillness of death in this shark, and the mild deadliness of his habits, the French call him Requin. End of footnote. Bethink thee of the albatross, whence come those clouds of spiritual wonderment and pale dread in which that white phantom sails in all imaginations, not Coleridge first threw that spell, but God's great unflattering laureate, Nature. Footnote. I remember the first albatross I ever saw. It was during a prolonged gale, in waters hard upon the Antarctic seas. From my forenoon watch below, I ascended to the overclouded deck, and there, dashed upon the main hatches, I saw a regal feathery thing of unspotted whiteness, and with a hooked Roman bill sublime. At intervals it arched forth its vast archangel wings, as if to embrace some holy ark. Wondrous flutterings and throbbings shook it. Though bodily unharmed, it uttered cries, as some king's ghost in supernatural distress. Through its inexpressible strange eyes, methought I peeped to secrets which took hold of God. As Abraham before the angels, I bowed myself. The white thing was so white, its wings so wide and in those forever exiled waters I had lost the miserable warping memories of traditions and of towns. Long I gazed at that prodigy of plumage. I cannot tell, can only hint the things that darted through me then. But at last I awoke, and turning asked a sailor what bird was this. A goni, he replied. Goni? Never had heard that name before. Is it conceivable that this glorious thing is utterly unknown to men ashore? Never. But some time after I learned that Goni was some seaman's name for albatross, so that by no possibility could Coleridge's wild rhyme have had aught to do with those mystical impressions which were mine when I saw that bird upon our deck. For neither had I then read the rhyme, nor knew the bird to be an albatross. Yet in saying this I do but indirectly burnish a little brighter the noble merit of the poem and the poet. I assert then that in the wondrous bodily whiteness of the bird chiefly lurks the secret of the spell, a truth more evinced in this, that by a solecism of terms there are birds called grey albatrosses, and these I have frequently seen, but never with such emotions as when I beheld the Antarctic fowl. But how had the mystic thing been caught? Whisper it not, and I will tell. With a treacherous hook and line, as the fowl floated on the sea. At last the captain made a postman of it, tying a lettered leathern tally round its neck, with the ship's time and place, and then letting it escape. But I doubt not that leathern tally, meant for man, was taken off in heaven, when the white fowl flew to join the wing-folding, the invoking and adoring cherubim. 
End of footnote. Most famous in our western annals and Indian traditions is that of the white steed of the prairies, a magnificent milk-white charger, large-eyed, small-headed, bluff-chested, and with the dignity of a thousand monarchs in his lofty, over-scorning carriage. He was the elected Xerxes of vast herds of wild horses, whose pastures in those days were only fenced by the Rocky Mountains and the Alleghanies. At their flaming head he westward trooped it, like that chosen star which every evening leads on the hosts of light. The flashing cascade of his mane, the curving comet of his tail, invested him with housings more resplendent than gold and silver beaters could have furnished him. A most imperial and archangelical apparition of that unfallen western world, which to the eyes of the old trappers and hunters revived the glories of those primeval times, when Adam walked majestic as a god, bluff-browed and fearless as this mighty steed, whether marching amid his aides and marshals in the van of countless cohorts that endlessly streamed it over the plains like an Ohio, or whether with his circumambient subjects browsing all around at the horizon, the white steed gallopingly reviewed them with warm nostrils reddening through his cool milkiness, in whatever aspect he presented himself always to the bravest Indians he was the object of trembling reverence and awe. Nor can it be questioned from what stands on legendary record of this noble horse, that it was his spiritual whiteness chiefly which so clothed him with divineness, and that this divineness had that in it which, though commanding worship, at the same time enforced a certain nameless terror. But there are other instances where this whiteness loses all that accessory and strange glory which invests it in the white steed and albatross. What is it that in the albino man so peculiarly repels and often shocks the eye, as that sometimes he is loathed by his own kith and kin? It is that whiteness which invests him, a thing expressed by the name he bears. The albino is as well made as other men, has no substantive deformity, and yet this mere aspect of all-pervading whiteness makes him more strangely hideous than the ugliest abortion. Why should this be so? Nor in quite other aspects does nature, in her least palpable but not the less malicious agencies, fail to enlist among her forces this crowning attribute of the terrible. From its snowy aspect, the gauntleted ghost of the southern seas has been denominated the white squall, nor, in some historic instances, has the art of human malice omitted so potent an auxiliary. How wildly it heightens the effect of that passage in Froissart, when, masked in the snowy symbol of their faction, the desperate white hoods of Ghent murder their bailiff in the market-place. Nor in some things does the common hereditary experience of all mankind fail to bear witness to the supernaturalism of this hue. It cannot well be doubted that the one visible quality in the aspect of the dead which most appalls the gazer is the marble pallor lingering there, as if indeed that pallor were as much like the badge of consternation in the other world as of mortal trepidation here. And from that pallor of the dead we borrow the expressive hue of the shroud in which we wrap them nor even in our superstitions do we fail to throw the same snowy mantle round our phantoms, all ghosts rising in a milk-white fog. Yea, while these terrors seize us, let us add that even the king of terrors, when personified by the evangelist, rides on his pallid horse. Therefore, in his other moods, symbolize whatever grand or gracious thing he will by whiteness, no man can deny that in its profoundest idealized significance it calls up a peculiar apparition to the soul. But though without dissent this point be fixed, how is mortal man to account for it? To analyze it would seem impossible. 
Can we then by the citation of some of those instances, wherein this thing of whiteness, though for the time either wholly or in great part stripped of all direct associations calculated to impart to it aught fearful, but nevertheless is found to exert over us the same sorcery, however modified, can we thus hope to light upon some chance clue to conduct us to the hidden cause we seek? Let us try. But in a matter like this, subtlety appeals to subtlety, and without imagination no man can follow another into these halls. And though doubtless some at least of the imaginative impressions about to be presented may have been shared by most men, yet few perhaps were entirely conscious of them at the time, and therefore may not be able to recall them now. Why, to the man of untutored ideality, who happens to be but loosely acquainted with the peculiar character of the day, does the bare mention of Whitsuntide marshal in the fancy such long, dreary, speechless processions of slow-pacing pilgrims, downcast and hooden with new-fallen snow? Or to the unread, unsophisticated Protestant of middle American states, why does the passing mention of a white friar or a white nun evoke such an eyeless statue in the soul? Or what is there, apart from the traditions of dungeoned warriors and kings, which will not wholly account for it, that makes the white tower of London tell so much more strongly on the imagination of an untravelled American than those other storied structures, its neighbours, the byward tower, or even the bloody, and those sublimer towers, the white mountains of New Hampshire, whence, in peculiar moods, comes that gigantic ghostliness over the soul at the bare mention of that name, while the thought of Virginia's Blue Ridge is full of a soft, dewy, distant dreaminess? Or why, irrespective of all latitudes and longitudes, does the name of the White Sea exert such a spectralness over the fancy, while that of the yellow sea lulls us with mortal thoughts of long, lacquered, mild afternoons on the waves, followed by the gaudiest and yet sleepiest of sunsets. Or, to choose a wholly unsubstantial instance, purely addressed to the fancy, why, in reading the old fairy tales of Central Europe, does the tall, pale man of the heart's forests whose changeless pallor unrustlingly glides through the green of the groves, why is this phantom more terrible than all the whooping imps of the Blocksburg? Nor is it altogether the remembrance of her cathedral toppling earthquakes, nor the stampedos of her frantic seas, nor the tearlessness of arid skies that never rain, nor the sight of her wide field of leaning spires, wrenched copestones, and crosses all a-droop, like canted yards of anchored fleets, and her suburban avenues of house-walls lying upon each other as a tossed pack of cards, it is not these things alone which make tearless Lima the strangest, saddest city thou canst see. For Lima has taken the white veil, and there is a higher horror in this whiteness of her woe. Old as Pizarro, this whiteness keeps her ruins for ever new, admits not the cheerful greenness of complete decay, spreads over her broken ramparts the rigid pallor of an apoplexy that fixes its own distortions. I know that, to the common apprehension, this phenomenon of whiteness is not confessed to be the prime agent in exaggerating the terror of objects otherwise terrible, nor to the unimaginative mind is there aught of terror in those appearances whose awfulness to another mind almost solely consists in this one phenomenon, especially when exhibited under any form at all approaching to muteness or universality. What I mean by these two statements may perhaps be respectively elucidated by the following examples. First, the mariner, when drawing nigh the coasts of foreign lands, if by night he hear the roar of breakers, starts to vigilance, and feels just enough of trepidation to sharpen all his faculties. But under precisely similar circumstances, let him be called from his hammock to view his ship sailing through a midnight sea of milky whiteness, 
as if from encircling headlands shoals of combed white bears were swimming round him then he feels a silent superstitious dread the shrouded phantom of the whitened waters is horrible to him as a real ghost in vain the lead assures him he is still off soundings heart and helm they both go down he never rests till blue water is under him again yet where is the mariner who will tell thee sir it was not so much the fear of striking hidden rocks as the fear of that hideous whiteness that so stirred me second to the native indian of peru the continual sight of the snow howdahead andes conveys naught of dread except perhaps in the mere fancying of the eternal frosted desolateness reigning at such vast altitudes and the natural conceit of what a fearfulness it would be to lose oneself in such inhuman solitudes much the same is it with the backwoodsman of the west who with comparative indifference views an unbounded prairie sheeted with driven snow no shadow of tree or twig to break the fixed trance of whiteness not so the sailor beholding the scenery of the antarctic seas where at times by some infernal trick of leisure domain in the powers of frost and air he shivering and half shipwrecked instead of rainbows speaking hope and solace to his misery views what seems a boundless churchyard grinning upon him with its lean ice monuments and splintered crosses but thou sayest methinks that white lead chapter about whiteness is but a white flag hung out from a craven soul thou surrenderest to a hypo ishmael tell me why this strong young colt fold in some peaceful valley of vermont far removed from all beasts of prey why is it that upon the sunniest day if you but shake a fresh buffalo robe behind him so that he can not even see it but only smells its wild animal muskiness why will he start snort and with bursting eyes paw the ground in frenzies of affright there is no remembrance in him of any gorings of wild creatures in his green northern home so that the strange muskiness he smells cannot recall to him anything associated with the experience of former perils for what knows he this new england colt of the black bisons of distant oregon no but here thou beholdest even in a dumb brute the instinct of the knowledge of the demonism in the world though thousands of miles from oregon still when he smells that savage musk the rending goring bison herds are as present as to the deserted wild foal of the prairies which in this instant they may be trampling into dust thus then the muffled rollings of a milky sea the bleak rustlings of the festooned frosts of mountains the desolate shiftings of the wind-road snows of prairies all these to ishmael are as the shaking of that buffalo robe to the frightened colt though neither knows where lie the nameless things of which the mystic sign gives forth such hints yet with me as with the colt somewhere those things must exist though in many of its aspects this visible world seems formed in love the invisible spheres were formed in fright but not yet have we solved the incantation of this whiteness and learned why it appeals with such power to the soul and more strange and far more portentous why as we have seen it is at once the most meaning symbol of spiritual things nay the very veil of the christian deity and yet should be as it is the intensifying agent in things most appalling to mankind is it that by its indefiniteness it shadows forth the heartless voids and immensities of the universe and thus stabs us from behind with the thought of annihilation when beholding the white depths of the milky way or is it that as in essence whiteness is not so much a colour as the visible absence of colour and at the same time the concrete of all colours is it for these reasons that there is such a dumb blankness full of meaning in a wide landscape of snows a colourless all colour of atheism from which we shrink and when we consider that other theory of the natural philosophers that all other earthly hues 
every stately or lovely emblazoning, the sweet tinges of sunset skies and woods, yea, the gilded velvets of butterflies, and the butterfly cheeks of young girls, all these are but subtle deceits, not actually inherent in substances, but only laid on from without, so that all deified nature absolutely paints like a harlot, whose allurements cover nothing but the charnel-house within. And when we proceed further, and consider that the mystical cosmetic, which produces every one of her hues, the great principle of light, forever remains white or colourless in itself, and, if operating without medium upon matter, would touch all objects, even tulips and roses, with its own blank tinge. Pondering all this, the palsied universe lies before us a leper, and like willful travellers in Lapland who refuse to wear coloured and colouring glasses upon their eyes, so the wretched infidel gazes himself blind at the monumental white shroud that wraps all the prospect around him. And of all these things, the albino whale was the symbol. Wonder ye then at the fiery hunt? Chapter 43 Hark! Hist! Did you hear that noise, Kabako? It was the middle watch, a fair moonlight. The seamen were standing in a cordon extending from one of the fresh water butts in the waist to the scuttle butt near the taffrail. In this manner they passed the buckets to fill the scuttle butt. Standing for the most part on the hallowed precincts of the quarter deck, they were careful not to speak or rustle their feet. From hand to hand the buckets went in the deepest silence, only broken by the occasional flap of a sail and the steady hum of the unceasingly advancing keel. It was in the midst of this repose that Archie, one of the cordon, whose post was near the after-hatches, whispered to his neighbour, a cholo, the words above. Hist! Did you hear that noise, Kabako? Take the bucket, will ye, Archie? What noise do you mean? There it is again, under the hatches. Don't you hear it? A cough! It sounded like a cough. Cough be damned. Pass along that return bucket. There again. There it is. It sounds like two or three sleepers turning over now. Caramba! Have done, shipmate, will ye? It's the three soaked biscuits ye eat for supper turning over inside of ye. Nothing else. Look to the bucket. Say what ye will, shipmate. I've sharp ears. Aye, you are the chap, ain't ye? that heard the hum of the old Quakeress's knitting needles fifty miles at sea from Nantucket. <laughs> You're the chap. Grin away. We'll see what turns up. Hark ye, Kabako. There is somebody down in the after hold that has not yet been seen on deck, and I suspect our old mogul knows something of it, too. I heard Stubb tell Flask one morning watch that there was something of that sort in the wind. Tish, the bucket. Chapter 44 The Chart Had you followed Captain Ahab down into his cabin after the squall that took place on the night succeeding that wild ratification of his purpose with his crew, you would have seen him go to a locker in the transom, and, bringing out a large wrinkled roll of yellowish sea charts, spread them before him on his screwed-down table, then, seating himself before it, you would have seen him intently study the various lines and shadings which there met his eye, and with slow but steady pencil trace additional courses over spaces that before were blank. At intervals he would refer to piles of old log-books beside him, wherein were set down the seasons and places in which, on various former voyages of various ships, sperm whales had been captured or seen. While thus employed, the heavy pewter lamp suspended in chains over his head continually rocked with the motion of the ship, and forever threw shifting gleams and shadows of lines upon his wrinkled brow, till it almost seemed that while he himself was marking out lines and courses on the wrinkled charts, 
some invisible pencil was also tracing lines and courses upon the deeply marked chart of his forehead. But it was not this night in particular that, in the solitude of his cabin, Ahab thus pondered over his charts. Almost every night they were brought out. Almost every night some pencil marks were effaced, and others were substituted. For with the charts of all four oceans before him, Ahab was threading a maze of currents and eddies, with a view to the more certain accomplishment of that monomaniac thought of his soul. Now to any one not fully acquainted with the ways of the Leviathans, it might seem an absurdly hopeless task thus to seek out one solitary creature in the unhooped oceans of this planet. But not so did it seem to Ahab, who knew the sets of all tides and currents, and thereby calculating the driftings of the sperm whale's food, and also calling to mind the regular ascertained seasons for hunting him in particular latitudes, could arrive at reasonable surmises, almost approaching to certainties, concerning the timeliest day to be upon this or that ground in search of his prey. So assured, indeed, is the fact concerning the periodicalness of the sperm whale's resorting to given waters, that many hunters believe that, could he be closely observed and studied throughout the world, were the logs for one voyage of the entire whale fleet carefully collated, then the migrations of the sperm whale would be found to correspond in invariability to those of the herring shoals or the flights of swallows. On this hint, attempts have been made to construct elaborate migratory charts of the sperm whale. Footnote. Since the above was written, the statement is happily borne out by an official circular, issued by Lieutenant Maury of the National Observatory, Washington, April 16, 1851. By that circular, it appears that precisely such a chart is in course of completion, and portions of it are presented in the circular. Quote, this chart divides the ocean into districts of five degrees of latitude by five degrees of longitude, perpendicularly through each of which districts are twelve columns for the twelve months, and horizontally through each of which districts are three lines, one to show the number of days that have been spent in each month in every district, and the two others to show the number of days in which whales, sperm, or right have been seen. End, quote. End of footnote. Besides, when making a passage from one feeding ground to another, the sperm whales, guided by some infallible instinct, say rather secret intelligence from the deity, mostly swim in veins, as they are called, continuing their way along a given ocean line with such undeviating exactitude that no ship ever sailed her course by any chart with one tithe of such marvellous precision though in these cases the direction taken by any one whale be as straight as a surveyor's parallel, and though the line of advance be strictly confined to its own unavoidable straight wake, yet the arbitrary vein in which at these times he is said to swim generally embraces some few miles in width, more or less as the vein is presumed to expand or contract, but never exceeds the visual sweep from the whale-ship's mastheads, when circumspectly gliding along this magic zone. The sum is, that at particular seasons within that breadth and along that path, migrating whales may, with great confidence, be looked for. And hence, not only at substantiated times, upon well-known separate feeding-grounds, could Ahab hope to encounter his prey, but in crossing the widest expanses of water between those grounds he could, by his art, so place and time himself on his way, as even then not to be wholly without prospect of a meeting. There was a circumstance which at first sight seemed to entangle his delirious but still methodical scheme, but not so in the reality, perhaps. Though the gregarious sperm-whales have their regular seasons for particular grounds, yet in general you cannot conclude that the herds which haunted such and such a latitude or longitude this year, say, 
will turn out to be identically the same with those that were found in the preceding season, though there are peculiar and unquestionable instances where the contrary of this has proved true. In general, the same remark, only within a less wide limit, applies to the solitaries and hermits among the matured aged sperm whales, so that though Moby Dick had in a former year been seen, for example, on what is called the Seychelles ground in the Indian Ocean, or Volcano Bay on the Japanese coast, yet it did not follow that were the Pequod to visit either of those spots at any subsequent corresponding season, she would infallibly encounter him there, so too was some other feeding grounds where he had at times revealed himself but all these seemed only his casual stopping places and ocean inns so to speak not his places of prolonged abode and where ahab's chances of accomplishing his object have hitherto been spoken of allusion has only been made to whatever wayside antecedent extra prospects were his ere a particular set time or place were attained, when all possibilities would become probabilities, and, as Ahab fondly thought, every possibility the next thing to a certainty. That particular set time and place were conjoined in the one technical phrase, the season on the line. For there and then, for several consecutive years, Moby Dick had been periodically descried, lingering in those waters for a while as the sun in its annual round loiters for a predicted interval in any one sign of the zodiac there it was too that most of the deadly encounters with the white whale had taken place there the waves were storied with his deeds there also was that tragic spot where the monomaniac old man had found the awful motive to his vengeance but in the cautious comprehensiveness and unloitering vigilance with which Ahab threw his brooding soul into this unfaltering hunt, he would not permit himself to rest all his hopes upon the one crowning fact above mentioned, however flattering it might be to those hopes, nor in the sleeplessness of his vow could he so tranquilize his unquiet heart as to postpone all intervening quest. Now the Pequod had sailed from Nantucket at the very beginning of the season on the line. No possible endeavor, then, could enable her commander to make the great passage southwards, double Cape Horn, and then, running down sixty degrees of latitude, arrive in the equatorial Pacific in time to cruise there. Therefore he must wait for the next ensuing season. Yet the premature hour of the Pequod's sailing had, perhaps, been correctly selected by Ahab, with a view to this very complexion of things, because an interval of three hundred and sixty-five days and nights was before him, an interval which, instead of impatiently enduring ashore, he would spend in a miscellaneous hunt, if by chance the white whale, spending his vacation in the seas far remote from his periodical feeding grounds, should turn up his wrinkled brow off the Persian Gulf, or in the Bengal Bay, or China Seas, or in any other waters haunted by his race. So that monsoons, pampas, nor'westers, harmattans, trades, any wind but the Levanter and Samoon, might blow Moby Dick into the devious zigzag world circle of the Pequod's circumnavigating wake. But, granting all this, yet regarded discreetly and coolly, Seems it not but a mad idea, this, that in the broad, boundless ocean, one solitary whale, even if encountered, should be thought capable of individual recognition from his hunter, even as a white-bearded mufti in the thronged thoroughfares of Constantinople? Yes, for the peculiar snow-white brow of Moby Dick, and his snow-white hump, could not but be unmistakable. And have I not tallied the whale, Ahab would mutter to himself, as after poring over his charts till long after midnight he would throw himself back in reveries, tallied him, and shall he escape? His broad fins are bored and scalloped out like a lost sheep's ear, and here his mad mind would run on in a breathless race, 
till a weariness and faintness of pondering came over him, and in the open air of the deck he would seek to recover his strength. Ah, God! What trances of torment does that man endure who is consumed with one unachieved, revengeful desire? He sleeps with clenched hands, and wakes with his own bloody nails in his palms. Often, when forced from his hammock by exhausting and intolerably vivid dreams of the night, which, resuming his own intense thoughts through the day, carried them on amid a clashing of frenzies, and whirled them round and round and round in his blazing brain till the very throbbing of his life-spot became insufferable anguish, and when, as was sometimes the case, these spiritual throes in him heaved his being up from its base, and a chasm seemed opening in him, from which forked flames and lightning shot up, and accursed fiends beckoned him to leap down among them. When this hell in himself yawned beneath him, a wild cry would be heard through the ship, and with glaring eyes Ahab would burst from his stateroom, as though escaping from a bed that was on fire. Yet these, perhaps, instead of being the unsuppressible symptoms of some latent weakness, or fright at his own resolve, were but the plainest tokens of its intensity. For at such times crazy Ahab, the scheming, unappeasedly steadfast hunter of the white whale, this Ahab that had gone to his hammock, was not the agent that so caused him to burst from it in horror again. The latter was the eternal living principle or soul in him, and in sleep, being for the time dissociated from the characterizing mind, which at other times employed it for its outer vehicle or agent, it spontaneously sought escape from the scorching contiguity of the frantic thing, of which, for the time, it was no longer an integral. But as the mind does not exist unless leagued with the soul, therefore it must have been that, in Ahab's case, yielding up all his thoughts and fancies to his one supreme purpose, that purpose, by its own sheer inveteracy of will, forced itself against gods and devils into a kind of self-assumed independent being of its own, nay, could grimly live and burn, while the common vitality to which it was conjoined fled, horror-stricken from the unbidden and unfathered birth. Therefore, the tormented spirit that glared out of bodily eyes, when what seemed Ahab rushed from his room, was for the time but a vacated thing, a formless, somnambulistic being, a ray of living light, to be sure, but without an object to colour, and therefore a blankness in itself. God help thee, old man. Thy thoughts have created a creature in thee and he whose intense thinking thus makes him a Prometheus, a vulture feeds upon that heart forever, that vulture, the very creature he creates. End of chapters 42 to 44